Dan Kerr here with, uh, from Robotics Trends uh, and Robotics Business Review. Uh, this afternoon we're interviewing Patrick Rowe, who's VP of R&D for our Pittsburgh-based RE Square. We're sitting down with Patrick this afternoon and asking him a couple of questions. First, Patrick, um, how old is RE Squared and how many employees do you have? Uh, RE Squared was founded in 2001, and we currently have 27 employees and are actively growing. Very good. That's, that's interesting in this time. Um, primarily, uh, what is the company known for? Uh, in the beginning, the company was known for a number of different robotics technologies, ground vehicles, as well as JAWS. Right now, we're focusing more on what we're calling intelligent modular manipulation. And that's really pushing the technology and the state of the art of current manipulation for ground robotics. Very interesting, and that's a, a very hot marketplace at this time. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, before we get into the specific to technology, a little bit about the business itself. Um, where are most of your lines of, uh, where does most of your revenue come from? How does, how does the company make money? Uh, most of our revenue comes from government contracts, such as uh, SBIRs. Uh, we've won a few BAAs from organizations like the Office of Naval Research, um, as well as some, uh, some opportunities to work with private companies that hire us for our expertise. But most of our business comes from government contracts like SBIRs. And my guess would be the largest percentage of people who are working here are engineering types? Yes, we have a number of different types of engineers, mechanical, electrical, and software engineers. Um, all of our technology is designed in-house. Uh, all the software is written and tested in-house. It sounds very interesting. And again, most of the work is through SBIRs. I asked you this question earlier. I'm going to ask it again. In terms of moving into commercial space, any thoughts on that for the company? Uh, we have. One of the things that we're trying to do is license our technology to uh, establish robotics companies. Uh, in terms of other markets, we see the medical market as being a potential opportunity in the future of where manipulation can be used, for example, manipulators on wheelchairs. Interesting. And so you're, uh, I don't know if you're actively, you're saying actively pursuing this, but you're open to partnerships and certainly with uh, technology licensing agreements for your, both your hardware and software technology. Yes, we're definitely opening, open to partnerships and to uh, establishing licensing arrangements and things like that. Okay. And then all the work is done here at RE Squared as opposed to outsourcing some of it? All of the design uh, the mechanical and electrical design is done here. We usually outsource the machining of the actual parts, uh, but then all the assembly and testing is done here as well as the software development. Great. Uh, and now let me, let's talk a little bit about sort of the more business-oriented components to it. Uh, we talked about the company was founded, when the company was founded. Can you tell me who founded the company and who the owners are at this time? Uh, the owners of the company are Jurgen and Jessica Pedersen, uh, the original co-founders. Okay, and I, the, the company, from what I understand, is privately owned. It is privately owned, yes. Are you, have you uh, did any, uh, have you were able to secure any uh, investment funding, or are you actively pursuing investment funding? Uh, we are not actively pursuing investment funding. We've never had any in the past, but we are not opposed to that. We are open to any possibilities, if it makes sense. And given the fact that you're mostly focused on sort of, sort of the, the mill aerospace, um, let me ask you the type of events you typically attend and how do you meet your customers? How do you get engaged with uh, with these different types of, of, of contracts and awards? Uh, well, most of our customers right now is the military and, and once you get established in that, um, usually there are follow-on projects, a lot of return business. But we do attend trade shows, for example, uh, the Ground Robotics Capabilities Conference, we attend AUVSI. Uh, we've also attended some other things that are kind of niche shows, like the American Telemedicine Association show. And then in terms of associations, in, in uh, any associations that you belong to, the, the company belongs to? I uh, believe we belong to AUVSI. Uh, we're also a member of the Robotics Technology Consortium. And we talked a little bit earlier about the number of people here and the, the, t the fact that most of them have an, an engineering background of some type. Uh, are there any specific uh, types of engineers or employees that you're looking for that you can't find enough of now, what, uh, which is a, a gating factor for you folks to move forward? Well, right now we're actually actively searching for engineers in all three disciplines, mechanical, electrical, and software. Um, we haven't really found a problem with hiring any one of those disciplines. Uh, we're also looking for technicians, electrical technicians, mechanical technicians, and machinists. So really all levels of capabilities.
So Patrick, let me ask you uh, for a second about your competitors. Who do you think are your, compo uh, your uh, closest competitors and what do you think the company's unique value proposition is? I think what's interesting about the robotics community is, is one day you could be partnering with someone and then the next day you're competing against them. So our competitors are also, have also been our partners, but I guess our main competitors are the companies that provide both a robotic base and a robotic manipulator, such as iRobot with, with their PackBot, such as uh, Kinetic with their Talon models, things like that, uh, Remote Tech with their F6A platforms. Um, but what we see is an opportunity to work with each of them to provide some unique technology that we bring to the table to improve their products. And so I think that's what differentiates us, is that each of our manipulation projects have had a slight twist or an advancement of the current state of the art, whether it's automatic tool change, whether it's more advanced controls, um, things like that. So I think that's where we see ourselves as positioning. And as a small company, I mean, certainly you don't want to leave any money on the table, but yet again, you don't want to, you know, die by you know, a thousand cuts. So you have to really focus on what do you think brings value to the company as well as a customer. So what do you look for in terms of projects then at RE2? What do they look for if they decide you know, we're going to pursue this particular initiative or this direction or not? Uh, over the past three or four years, we've been building up a core technology base regarding intelligent modular manipulation. So we look for projects that advance that core technology, whether it's um, developing a, a new arm that has different capabilities, for example, a lighter weight arm, uh, whether it's developing a more advanced hand, that would be something that feeds into our core technology base, uh, whether it's putting advanced sensing on our manip manipulators, such as uh, force feedback or more perception sensing. So we look for projects and opportunities that can help us add on to our core technology base. So it would be fair to say that you're going to focus more on mobile arms and hands and manipulation as opposed to, say, the platforms themselves, the mobile platforms themselves? Right now, that seems to be the way we're going, although uh, we have had a, pro or a, a program that developed a mobile platform, and uh, if it makes sense, uh, we might pursue that again. But right now, we're really trying to focus on putting most of our efforts into advancing our manipulation technologies. Okay. One other question. Um, right now, you're the, the manipulation experts. At, at one time, you were the JAWS experts and probably still are the JAWS experts. What is the, the state and status of JAWS at this time? Maybe you can speak to that. And also, is there any commercial opp opportunities or implications for that standard? Um, that's a good question. Right now, we kind of see the JAWS standard as being in flux. We're not really sure how much support it currently has within the community and within the marketplace. Um, what's really going to need to happen to, pers to push JAWS more is there needs to be either a champion for it in the government or there needs to be a mandate for it in the government where the government says we will only accept things that are JAWS compliant. There has to be some sort of uh, something like that which will help drive the, the further development of JAWS. So right now we're kind of in a wait and see pattern to see where everything falls into place. Is there anything else out there that competes with that standard that offers the same level? Not really. Um, there are slightly different things. For example, uh, Willow Garage offers a freely available tool called Robotic Operating System. Right. Uh, JAWS could conceivably be implemented using Robotic Operating System, so they're not exactly the same thing. Um, but again, that is a, a freely available open source product, which uh, I think is, is a problem that JAWS is facing right now. And supported by a company with money and, and, and pretty good people running it. Yes, and resources. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's about it for now. I want to thank Patrick Rowe, who is the uh, Director of Research and Development for RE Squared. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah.